So this morning, well actually this week, uh, last Sunday when Brother Woodcock asked me if I could preach Sunday night because he would be gone, you know, I said, you know, absolutely. And I started just trying to think about what God would have me to preach, you know, and I was kind of wrestling with that for a little bit. I didn't really know, and I was kind of just, you know, going like, all right, hmm, no, that's not a good one. And, you know, just tried to think of something. And then I, I started actually studying Psalms 117, and it wasn't until after Wednesday night where I didn't feel like that's actually where the Lord wanted me to preach. And I can see that now because what I would have been preaching out of Psalms 117 would have been very familiar and close to what Josh was preaching this morning. So I just could see the Lord's hand in that. It was like, no, 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 no. I've already got someone covering that, so we're good. Um, but it was actually after Wednesday night the Lord uh, laid this passage of Scripture um, on my heart. And if you go to my Wednesday night class, okay, which is... Uh, the kids, you'll be very familiar with the story because it's, uh, well, what I taught Wednesday night. So, um, you know, don't tell, don't spoil it for your parents or anything like that. You know, just let the suspense be there the entire message. That would be great, okay? All right, but um, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter number 19. Luke chapter number 19, and please stand for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter number 19, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And the Bible says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought out, or he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today and uh, just for already the great time that we've had uh, in your house, Lord, this morning and for the singing, the, the preaching that we've already heard. And Lord, for tonight, <clears throat> for gathering tonight and just again singing praises to you and glorifying you who is worthy of it all. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just be with the message tonight. You calm my nerves and to help me to deliver what you want delivered. And uh, as I pray, you'd speak to our hearts. And it's Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. <clears throat> so every four years we have uh, the Olympics that will, you know, come on. And every time the Olympics starts. Uh, I, I entertain myself with watching a lot of the events that are going on, whatever might be going on. It doesn't really matter whether it's swimming, running, or, or whatever. And then we also have the Winter Olympics, which I will watch that too. And that's probably the only time where I will watch like snowboarding and skiing is during the Olympic times. Uh, it's just, it just catches my interest and and so I, I, and I find it just incredible watching these 
professional athletes, like when I'm watching snowboarding, watch them do these amazing like tricks and stunts, things that they've uh, practiced for years and years and years to be really good at. And these guys make, you know, they're easy tricks, which is not even a, a trick for them. It's just like a normal part of snowboarding. You know, they'll just do a quick 180 here, like no big deal. You know, if I tried that, I would be just tumbling down, you know, it, planting my face into the snow. Um, it, you know, it, it, it takes practice. If you've never been on a s snowboard, it's just, it can be kind of hard to even balance. But these guys are doing 180s, and then they'll move to like a 360, and then they'll go from a 360 to a 540, and then it just gets crazier and crazier from there, just the things that they uh, will do. But it's just fascinating. Now, in our text, we're not going to be talking about sports or anything like that, but what we are going to see in our passage is a man, Zacchaeus, who did a complete 180 with his life. Well, what is a 180? Well, okay, so if you don't know what a 180 is, you're basically facing one direction and you turn the complete opposite direction, okay? That's the easiest way to describe it. And that's what we're going to see with Zacchaeus. He was living his life in one way, and then we'll see just in like a blink of an eye, he changes his life and, go, and is starting to go a different path from it. Now, I want to kind of build the, the background. So in, in chapter number 18, uh, if you look in there a little bit, Jesus, he's on his way actually to Jerusalem. And as he's on his way to Jerusalem, he stops by towns that are on the way and, and he, he talks, he speaks to the people and he preaches to them and, and he performs miracles. Okay. And in chapter number 18, I find it interesting that we actually have the rich young ruler that account there in the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Okay, here this rich young ruler is and, and he was a respectable person and, and he tried to, to live right. And he's asking Jesus, what, what am I supposed to do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus tells him in verse number 20, he says, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And, and the rich young ruler says to him, Well, all these have I kept from my youth up. I've, I've kept all of those things. And then Jesus says to him, Yet lackest thou one thing. And he says, Sell Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And the story ends, you know, kind of sad. The man just walked away. The Bible says very sorrowful because he was very rich. And then in the next chapter... We get to Zacchaeus, who was also rich. He wasn't a ruler of any kind, but he was a man of authority. He was the chief among the publicans. So he did have, in his respected occupation, um, authority there. And, and, and he was rich as well. But we have a man here, the rich young ruler, who seeks Jesus. He's like, I, I, I'm missing something. What must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus tells him what, what he must do, you know, to sell uh, what he has, to give what he has to the poor and to follow him. Yet he wasn't willing to do that because of the comfortable life he was living in. He wasn't willing to give that up and follow Jesus. And then we get to Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus, he, as best as we know, it, it looks like he was a Jew because in verse number nine, Jesus said that he is a son of Abraham. But, you know, he, he was rich himself and he was, uh, again, a man of authority. And Jesus, he's entering into Jericho and passing through Jericho. And, and Zacchaeus, no doubt, hears about Jesus and hears about this man. Uh, just in the chapter before, right before this, Jesus had 
healed a blind man, he given a blind man his, his, his sight. So no doubt Zacchaeus had probably heard about people talking about this Jesus and how he's been able to perform all these miracles. And, and he's probably heard about his popularity. And so Zacchaeus was curious. He, was, he started to seek out to find Jesus, to find out who he was, and, and to see maybe if, if Jesus might be offering something that, that he doesn't have. And so in verse number three, that's what we see. He sought to see Jesus, who he was, but the Bible says he couldn't because of the press. There were so many people that he wasn't able to get through, and he was a man that was not the average size of person. The Bible says he was small in stature, so he had problems there. He, he wasn't able to find Jesus. And I... I find it interesting, and, and I, I kind of stopped here and, and thought, how many times, you know, even for us who are saved, might take the time to try to seek out maybe what the Lord's will is for our life, but then when just obstacles or things get in the way, you know, we just give up right there. Oh, let's, you know, let's go home, you know. That wasn't Zacchaeus, though. He, he was like, okay, I don't care if I can't get through. I'm going to find some way to be able to see Jesus. And so in verse number four, he, he, he ran before the crowd, got ahead of them, and he found the sycamore tree, which is a big tree, um, very good climbing tree, got big branches, and he climbed up that tree and sat on one of the branches, and, you know, he knew that Jesus and the crowd would be coming that direction, and he just, he just waited. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Jesus came right to him. Now, here's what I find interesting. We have Zacchaeus that was searching and looking for Jesus, to see Jesus. And there's a lot of people today that might be searching for Jesus. They might not know they're searching for him. They might not have ever heard of him, but they're searching for him. And God was searching for us, and he, he was searching. He's searching for our fellowship and a relationship with us. But what I find just great as well in verse number five, it says that Jesus came to the place and he looked up and saw him and he said to Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must abide at thy house. It wasn't just that Zacchaeus that was searching for Jesus. Jesus was also looking for Zacchaeus. And that's, and that's just the great thing about it. Even when we forget Jesus and, and we're no longer looking for his fellowship, he's still like knocking at the door wanting that fellowship. He's still searching us out, and he's still searching those that, that are lost. He hasn't forgotten about anyone, and he's searching for us too. And so he says, you know, Zacchaeus, make haste, you know, come down. I, I need to go to your house today. And in verse number six, this is what Zacchaeus does. He made haste, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. He was excited about it. He was like, Jesus wants to spend time at my house. He probably wasn't used to that. Because most people uh, didn't really like Zacchaeus because he was a tax collector. He collected people's money and he wasn't uh, very honest about it. He would charge people more money than what, than what they actually owed. And, every, and people knew that. And so they, they did not like Zacchaeus. And so Zacchaeus was, he was, he was just fascinated by this. And he was like, this is... This is great, and I, I, I've found myself stopping from verse to verse just on what this unsaved man at the time was doing, and what myself as a Christian, what I, the, the things that I don't do that I should be doing. He was seeking out Jesus. He was he was looking to meet him, maybe, uh, maybe talk to him. And I find myself sometimes in my life not looking for the fellowship. And I find myself sometimes when, when, when Jesus is, is trying to get my attention, not even wanting to come and to welcome Jesus into my life or welcome him in, in, you know, in, in, into fellowshipping with him. And here we have an unsaved man that 
that received Jesus joyfully. He loved it. He, he, he wanted to get to know Jesus. And that's what he did. And then the story kind of takes its view off of Zacchaeus and Jesus just for a second, and it points it to the crowd in verse number 7, okay? The rest of the multitude in the crowd that was there. And it says, and when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And I kind of find that funny. So here they are murmuring. In other words, they were complaining that Jesus was going to Zacchaeus' house. They were like, I can't believe he's going to that guy's house. He's a sinner. Can you believe that? And I'm just thinking, well, aren't they sinners too? What, what's going on here? Like, don't they know that everyone, you know, like, uh, we're, we're all, you know, we're all sinners? But that was, that, that was their thought. Their thought was, was, I haven't done what Zacchaeus has done. Okay? Now, I might have sinned, you know, and I might not be a sinner, but I'm not as bad of a sinner as Zacchaeus is. And isn't that um, true in some of our, our lives where we might look at someone and judge them and think of that like, well, they shouldn't get privileged like that because, you know, I might be a sinner, but I'm, I definitely didn't do anything as bad as what that person did. Which is the absolute wrong way to think because actually if you look in the Word of God in Romans, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. It doesn't matter that if, you know, you don't struggle in one particular sin that another person does. It doesn't make you better than them. We're all sinners. We're all sinners, and we, not, we all need to come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so then, we turn our focus back to Zacchaeus in verse number 8. It says, Zacchaeus, he stood, and he said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. In other words, I'm going to restore the, the, the person, the amount that I took from him, times four. Okay, four times as much as what I, I, I took from him to make things right with that individual. Now, here's, this is where... These false teachers and these false prophets and people who say, you, you know, they're, they're pastors and, and they get uh, mixed up with this verse and they try to mix their uh, people up with this verse. They, they'll say, see, Zacchaeus, after he did these things, he got saved. See, perfect example of how you have to work for your salvation but that's not, that's, not what, that's not what this is showing at all. Actually, Zacchaeus, he was already a changed man before verse number 8 even came. He actually started to change when he, guess this, when he received Jesus. When he received Jesus with joy, that's when his life started to change from one direction to another direction. And what verse number 8 is actually showing is the evidence of a changed man. It's the evidence of someone who was living in one direction and they completely changed and started living the other direction and he was given everyone that was there proof that I'm changed. I am different than what I was before. I'm no longer that man that you once knew me as. This is how I am now. Because he started to let, this is, this, is, this is what happened to Zacchaeus. Instead of Zacchaeus allowing the Romans and, and uh, other people that he might have worked with or grown up with, people, instead of allowing all these other influence fill his life up on how he should live his life, he received Jesus and started allowing Jesus to fill and God fill his life up and influence his life. And that's what we see from Zacchaeus. And Jesus then said, you know, this day salvation has come to this house, for as he is also a son of Abraham. In verse number 10, it's like Jesus, you know, tells us kind of to the crowd, because he knew they were complaining and murmuring. And he says, 
For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hey, I ain't come down here to just sit in fellowship with the righteous or with people that, you know, are, are saved. I mean, that's a good thing to do, but I have come to seek and to save those that don't know me. That, that, that is what I've come to do, to seek and to save those that are lost, that which are, are lost. And that's exactly what Jesus wants, um, what God has for us as Christians that have already accepted Jesus as he wants us to have that same passion and to seek out those that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior and share with them the gospel. Now, none of us can, can actually save a person. We don't have the power to do that. God's the only one that has the power to save an individual, but our responsibility is to share with them how they can accept Christ as their Savior. And then once we have fulfilled that responsibility of doing that, we, we pray for that individual, and then it's, it's, it's up to them. It's their choice. Can't force them into it. It's their choice. See, a person's life, it, a person's life will change when they receive Jesus. It's not... Anything that you do that will change your life, but when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. <clears throat> you can't do anything to obtain salvation. You just need to accept the free gift that he's extending out to you. And if there is anyone here today and you don't know Jesus as your as your Savior, or maybe, maybe you haven't thought about it before, or maybe uh, you're struggling with it. I, I, I don't know. But can I encourage you in this way to get that settled today, to get that settled uh, here tonight? Because you never know. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't, you, you don't know if you're going to uh, be here on this earth uh, another day. So when you have the chance, do it. Some, some might be just like that rich young ruler who is kind of comfortable where they're at and they're not quite ready to give up what they have and follow Jesus and to, li and to, live, that, to live that life. But can I encourage you that it doesn't matter what you have or how comfortable you're living down here on earth. What matters is eternity. Where you're going to spend eternity. <clears throat> and I know that this uh, passage of scripture is, is more probably pointed towards um, uh, those who, who aren't saved and, and those who are still lost. But I, I, I believe here tonight that uh, we that are saved and and, and have already accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, can learn a lot from an unsaved man who was unsaved, and from when he was unsaved to where then where he got saved. You see, what we as Christians can actually do sometimes in our lives is we can, even though we're saved, we can start to allow... Um, people or the world to fill our lives up and stop allowing God to fill us up. And I, I kind of want to, I, I want to show you kind of how, what that looks like. So if the guys that I talked to before the service can come up here and help me with this. So remember, just don't mess anything up. So yeah, just move it right over, right over here up front. That's good, thank you guys. Oh good, you didn't spill anything. Whew. I told them that if they spilled the water, one of them better be running to get a towel and the other one better be filling the pitcher back up. <coughs> All right. So... All right, so this, let's say this represents your life, okay? This is 
your vessel, all right? And these, okay, these orange ping pong balls, they represent uh, people or the world. Okay, so here's how this works. Um, maybe you start young. You, you know, you're a kid. You start to go to uh, a new school, and you start to meet people. And the people that you meet, uh, maybe there's, there's some that don't like your, your genes or, or the teacher. They, they think you learn a funny or different way. And, um, you know, you've got siblings that pick on you. And then you start to get older and people say, hey, you should start hanging out with, with these people. Or if you really want to exceed in life, you need to hang out with, with those people, you know, and, and try to start influencing you, you in that way of what kind of people you should be hanging out with and, and what you should be doing. And then you get to maybe being a young adult and you, you start looking at what you already, what, what you should have by the time you're 19, okay, or by the time you're 20. Okay, now come on. All, all of us have, have thought about that before of, of like, oh, we're, we're thinking about our age and, and what we should have by now or where we should be at. You know, especially the young people. When I was, you know, when I was turning 18, 19, I was thinking, man, I should have a car by now. I should be making a lot of money by now. Um, some of you are like, I should be married. I should have a house. I should have kids by now. Uh, and and we, we just start, our lives just start to fill up <coughs> with everything that what people have said, this is what you should be doing. This is what you should have by now. And we let our lives get filled up like that. And we don't really leave any room for God. And as we live our lives like this, as, as a Christian, we look like everyone else. We live like everyone else. And so we're not being a good light to anyone of those that are lost. They might look at you and be like, I don't see anything that you have that I don't have. You know? And that's how we can live our lives uh, somehow. But then, we, then we, we get in the Word and we look at the Word in 2 Peter chapter number 1. In 2 Peter chapter number 1. And we see in verse number 3 it says, According to... As his, that's God, so according as his divine power hath given unto us all things, get that? He's given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. See, this is what we start thinking. We think that people have what we need or can give us what we need. And we think uh, 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 people can give us an identity. And we think people can set our parameters. But then when we look at the Word of God and, and, and God gets a hold of our hearts, He says, I've already given you everything that you need for this life. I am the supplier of it. I've given you everything that you need to live this life and to live a godly life. I've given it to you. And maybe the Lord starts to hopefully work on our hearts by that. And we, and we start thinking, well, how, how, can I, how can I get all of this out of my life? You know, I, I want to change, but I don't, know how to, I don't know how to take care of this. How do you do that? Through the Word. By letting God speak to you through his word and, and, and speak back to him by, by, by prayer and, and maybe start um, incorporating the things that God is speaking to you about, incorporating those in your life. And as you start to do that, things can change. So let's take this water and... 
This is living water, okay? And you say, you know, Lord, I'm going to just start reading my Bible every day. You know, I'm just, I'm just going to, you know, start, start small, you know, just start doing that. And God starts pouring into our life. But at first, it just doesn't seem like anything's changing. Feels like everything's the same. Like what I'm doing, it just doesn't seem like anything's happening. And a lot of times for us, we can start to do something, but since we don't see a change right away, we can actually stop what we're doing. But anything that's worth doing is worth doing continually. And so that's where you have to get the discipline. And at some point, as you're continuing to do this and you're incorporating more things that the Lord wants you to do, the things that once was defining your life, they, they start to be overtaken or overwhelmed by what God is doing to your life. And as, as you start to let God do, fill your life up, he starts to take all those other things out of your life. But say, what happens when we're better than what we used to be? And we stop letting God pour into our life. What this looks like, or what we look like, that, that is lukewarm. You know, we're, we're a Christian, we come to church, you know, and we'll read our Bibles or something like that. But then, then you know, through the weekdays, we go to work, and, you know, we go back to our old influences. So, in other words... I can post anything that I want to on my social media page because I don't really have my identity yet in Christ. And that'll be okay. No one really, uh, any of my outside friends think of that. And we just want to try to hold on to still the things that people, of what people have said that we should be doing and how we should live our life. If I were actually, if someone were actually in the back of the parking lot and I t uh, pointed to them and, and, and said, what do you see? The, all they might see at this point are just those orange balls. They might not even know there's any water in it. Just like they can see your inconsistencies as you try to live a double life. And what happens is... Lost persons are like, well, I don't want that. Looks like they're having a harder time living life than I am. It's because you're trying to live two lives and it just doesn't work out that way. And maybe, you know, through the word and through the Lord that the Lord speaks to your, to your heart again, he's like, you know, don't stop there. Just let me, let me keep, just let me pour more of myself into your life, Okay. So then I can start defining, defining uh, uh, you and, and, and you, rely, you allow me to, to uh, supply your needs and, and to take care of uh, you. And you let me um, 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 uh, make your identity and, and you allow me to set your parameters and you allow me to, to influence your life. Now, here's the thing. None of us are perfect. We're not going to be perfect in this, this life. We're, we're, we're never going to be perfect. But here's the great thing about it. As we continue to allow God to pour into our lives, the lies that the enemy bring us, that, that, they can't dig deeper into your life and stick there. They only can remain at the surface of things. They're, they're not able to, to stick to your life and build and build and build upon lie, upon lie, upon lie, because you know what? You just keep allowing God to keep pouring into your life and letting him influence you and not everyone else or the world influence you. I don't know where 
Um, your life might be today. I, I, I don't know where any of us might be at. I know where, you know, I know where I'm at. I know that there's uh, things that, that, that uh, I need to work on and I have to work on them daily. There's always things that we have to work on spiritually to, to try to have a closer relationship um, with God. But I, can I encourage you in this way that uh, the Lord is wanting us to have the same passions that he, have, that he has and to seek out those people that are lost. And the best way to do that is to be a light that people can actually see and they can look at your life and, and you're living it in such, a, in such a way that there's something different about you and they could just tell. You don't even have to really say anything, but they can tell just by how you're living your life that there's something different about, about them and it might be worth just talking to them because they seem happy all the time. They seem joyful all the time. That's how Zacchaeus was when he got saved. He was joyful. He was happy. He didn't care if he was getting rid of some of his money and helping other people out. That made him feel more better. And when people see that, they start to think, you know, whatever they have, I want that. And just how we live our life, if we live our life like that, and just start seeking out those who are lost, okay, and just through our example, God can, you, can work in them in such a greater way than what he could if we're living our life like everyone else is. So can I encourage you today to... Stop letting other, the world to identify who you are and stop letting the, uh, the, the world um, give you a purpose and stop letting the world um, set your parameters, but instead let God start filling your life up and let, let him give you the identity that you, that you should have and let him give you a, the, the, the purpose that you should have. Let God set your parameters and let God fill you up. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for...